Good morning. Here are your announcements. Walk with Christ and be baptized. Sign up on a connection card or at thewayberkeley.com slash connect. Be prepared to attend the baptism class, which happens on the day you're baptized. We commit to helping you grow as a Christian. Sign up for the available live groups at thewayberkeley.com slash grow. Students and families with students, be sure to join us for Back to School Sunday on August 20th. At service, get the boost you need for a successful school year. Get a free session with a licensed clinician by signing up at thewayberkeley.com. Join your friends who have expanded their service to our community. You can serve for a term on one of our ministry teams. Sign up at thewayberkeley.com slash grow in order to serve. What are the ways in which we create a space of hope in really difficult situations? How do we create opportunities for young people who live in situations that are really treacherous? Join us in this discussion of healing and urban education. Come to the final session of our Hope and Healing Summer Series of Books and Breakfast. Sean Jenright will share the findings from his recent book. Books and Breakfast is Saturday, August 26th from 10 a.m. to noon. Take the journey with Brittany Richardson as she tells the story of a woman who suffers childhood sexual abuse, finds healing and community through the arts, and moves to Africa to use the arts to bring healing to other exploited young girls. Art and Abolition is on Thursday, August 31st at 8 p.m. You can access these updates and more at thewayberkeley.com. Enjoy your week. All right, clap your hands, everybody, for those great announcements. All right, turn with us really quickly, if you don't mind, to the book of 2 Chronicles. No, 2 Kings. Yes, 2 Kings, chapter number 23. We are... uh, I left my notes. Did I leave my notes? All right, so you know this is going to be short, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. All right. All right, 2 Kings chapter number 23, verse number 1. We are uh, diving into a, a record of the, the nation Israel. Uh, the kings that followed after uh, uh, some of the the more prominent kings, if you will, when Israel finally became a nation that was ruled by kings, if you will, uh, they uh, had three kings that were kind of ruling over uh, the whole nation of Israel as one. Uh, The first king, uh, you may remember, all you Bible students was... Saul. Thank God somebody still reads their Bible. Praise God. And then after Saul, there was David. Touch your neighbor. And after David, there was Solomon. And then the whole thing fell apart. Amen. Which is instructive because kingdoms and empires don't last forever. And although uh, many of us may not fully appreciate how our country is a kingdom and empire all in and of itself, uh, that there is a time in history where this country will unravel. And I hope it's not now uh, because there are so many uh, other kind of factors at play in the global politic uh, where if things were to fall apart, uh, there would be chaos in the world. Some would say there's already chaos, but if we think it's chaos now, there may be even more chaos, but we don't know. Either way, we know that God has been consistent across time. God's people have been present across time. And in every time, there has always been a call to God's people to live justly in the world. No matter what circumstance you find yourself in, we who follow the ways of Jesus are called to live in the world in a particular way. And here we find a young king who comes of age uh, after Solomon. The kingdom was divided into two uh, uh, parts, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. We talked or heard 
All right. We talked and heard a little bit about some of this earlier with uh, uh, a little uh, part of that uh, when uh, Sister Sarah was talking about North and South Korea. Literally, uh, the, there were interests that divided the, the Israel into two parts, North and Southern Kingdom. And, and, and in this particular text, we're seeing one of the Northern Kingdoms, I believe, uh, being uh, ruled and uh, overseen by a young teenager who comes of age, and his name is Josiah. That's what we're reading today, a little bit of the record of that. Verse number one of Kings chapter number 23, Then the king directed that all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem should be gathered to him, and the king went up to the house of the Lord, and with him went all the people of Judah, all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. Think about this. The king Josiah called the whole country together. Everybody was included. It was an inclusive call to everyone. Why? Uh, verse number uh, three uh, or, or uh, half of number two. He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord, keep his commandments, his decrees, his statutes with all his heart and his soul to perform the words of the covenant that were written in this book. And all the people, somebody say all the people. Come on, everybody say all the people. If you are one of the people, somebody say all the people. All the people joined in covenant. Verse number 15. Moreover, the altar at Bethel. Uh, the high place erected by Jeroboam, son of Nebat, who caused Israel to sin. Josiah gathered all of the elders, the high priests, at the altar at Bethel, a high place that was erected by Jeroboam, who was the former king. He brought them to this place, the high place, that caused the people to sin and Josiah pulled down that altar along with the high place. He burned the high place, crushing it to dust. He also burned the sacred pole. As Josiah turned, he saw the tombs there on the mount, and he sent and took the bones out of the tombs, burned them on the altar, defiled them according to the word of the Lord that the man of God proclaimed. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to continue in this theme of the tools that we can use literally to pull down the high places. And we've gone through a number of them. This particular uh, tool that I want to acknowledge or put forth in front of us is a tool of scripture, of preaching, of reflecting on the word and faithfully applying it to our lives. So we'll talk for the few moments uh, uh, why we must pull down these high places, or dare even I say idols. Bow your heads with me and let us pray. Father, we thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our heart so we will not sin against you. Please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me and even the hearers of this word in Jesus' name. We pray, let the people of God say amen. amen. Now, it is indeed the case that uh, as we talked last week about foundations, how many were here for our foundations sermon last week? We kind of uh, unknowingly, uh, but certainly it would make sense because this is not a new reality uh, of dealing with uh, a way of life and existence in this cultural context called the United States of America, dare we say Western civilization, dare we say the world as it is today that we are a people following the God of all creation in an environment that has often hijacked the truth of God and made it to serve the interests of the powerful and the elite. People who, in their own mind, if you gave them a truth pill, think that they are God and are often putting uh, the worship of God through the practices of our faith traditions in service to their own interests, rather than understanding that the earth is the Lord's 
and everything. Everybody say everything. Everything Everything that lives within it. That means you are the Lord's. Hello, somebody. I am the Lord's. The land is the Lord's. Even some of them crazy folk you don't like. They the Lord's business too. Uh, I know someone's like, Lord, you show sure taking your time to deal with these folk I don't like. Do I have an honest church up in here today? And how many know they're not the ones on TV we talking about? They the folk in your house, folk in your cubicle, folk on your block. Anybody ever prayed on somebody else and it's like, God, you got to deal with them? <laughs> and we laugh. What's so dangerous about that is what if they praying the same thing about you? So it's like this interesting dynamic, right, where God is listening to the prayers. And I don't know if they just neutralize each other as they get into uh, God's prayer chamber or if God just be like, I'm not listening to you. Kind of like my daughters be talking crazy. They come in the room. Daddy, I want to go skydiving. I'll be like, I'm not listening to you. Because why would we do that? There's a number of ways for folk to die. I mean, no, skydiving ain't one of them. Touch your neighbor. And, and I think God feels like that sometimes. There's a number of prayer requests for me to respond to. But me putting trouble on your, uh, your enemy at the time is not one of them. But how many of you know we are not like that at all? Because if we fall out with each other, we are quick to put trouble on our enemy. We are quick to wish ill of our enemy. We are quick to surrender the call that we have been uh, 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 committed to, to steward the world and all that is in it. And I want to submit to you that what is happening right now in our country is that we are falling down on our call to steward well that which God has given. And the first thing that you got to appreciate is that the greatest gift that has been given to us is one another. It is not your house. It is not your material things. It is your loved one sitting next to you, living with you in life, in, 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 in love, in, in relationship, uh, in community, in nation, in continent. The greatest gift that has been given to you is your Brother, your sister, your loved one, the created one in the image of God. And when we don't live up to the stewarding of our neighbor, then I want to argue that we have rejected the God of creation and fallen into an inferior God who is not even able to hold your life, much less the life of the one you're trying to put trouble on. Here in the text, we find that when Josiah came of age and he became the king, Josiah quickly realized that the covenant the people of Israel made to God had been largely forgotten by the people because of terrible leadership and or rejected by the people because of their unfaithfulness. And so one of the first things Josiah as a teenager did was to regather everyone and remind them of their covenant responsibilities. And part of what I think the church has to do in America is start to remember our covenant responsibility. We don't get to opt out of taking care of our neighbor. Hello, somebody. And we don't get to choose violence as the muscle memory response to take care of our neighbor. And you and I now are being challenged in an imperialistic, genocidal empire to respond to the worst conditions of our life with violence. Violence of words violence of actions, violence of policies, violence of relationships, 
when we ourselves are not dealt with violently by the one who created us. I mean, what do you think about this for a second? Because uh, I want, you know, to challenge you and I that although we may find ourselves struggling to steward ourselves, our families, and one another well, you and I must not tap out of the struggle just because it's hard. But we must bear witness. Why? Because when we fail to bear witness, one of the first things that I think will happen uh, in our lives is we will begin to lose sight of the God of our creator who is calling for our allegiance and the idols of our culture that are calling for our devotion. The first thing that I want to test with you today is God versus the idols. If we're going to tear down these strongholds, if we're going to tear down these high places, you and I have to realize that there is a perpetual struggle between God and the idols. Now, understand, God's not struggling with the idols. You and I are. <laughs> Touch your neighbor. Amen. The God of all creation, the God that created everything, is not struggling with a lifeless, created thing. It's like you're trying to have an a, a arm wrestling thing with my phone. I mean, my phone can't do much to me unless I allow it to. Amen. It's no match. So God and the idols are, is not an even match. But how many of you know in our lives, God and the idols are one heck of a match. Why? Because many of us will create idols in our own image and attribute Godness, divine power, divine importance to those idols. In this country, we know that the idolatry at work, certainly we saw it on display, not just in the last 24 hours, not just in the last six months, not just in the last four, five, eight years, not in just the last 25 years, but since the inception of this country, an idol has been built. And that idol is called white supremacy, imperialism, racial hierarchy, an idol that robs you and I of the responsibility to take good care of one another. And too often the church has been unable to stop worshiping at that idol. We've been building buildings claiming to worship the God of all creation. But yet we set up inside the temple an idol. That's what happened here in this story. Josiah was not going to the temple of Baal to tear down the idol. He was going inside the temple of Jerusalem. Ain't that something that you and I can be in a place that is supposed to be devoted to the work of God and yet still build an idol. Something that competes for your loyalty and your ultimate call. And part of what I believe the church has to answer very clearly is who will we serve in this moment? Will we disentangle the worship of the God of all creation and the devotion to this idol of racial hierarchy, white supremacy, racism, classism, all these things that rob you of the gift to take care of your loved one. So say, Pastor, that's, that, that's a gift to take care of them? Obviously, you don't know who them is. <laughs> huh. Well, how many know we all got thems in our family? How many know we all got thems in our neighborhood? How many know we all got thems in our state? And we all got thems in our country. 
And how many know at one part of your life, you are the thems? I wish I could talk to you near today. <laughs> Ain't it the height of, of arrogance to think that you are never the source of somebody's problem? That you are always the solution? Anybody mess somebody like that? Like, ah, the best thing since sliced bread. No, clearly not. You just you're just a little too preoccupied with yourself. Stewardship requires community. And this is so important. Why? Because we worship the God of all creation. Now, in the Christian faith and tradition, when we say God, according to the old school matriarchs, patriarchs of the church, Gregory of Nazianza and uh, Nyssa, I think Jasmine, is Jasmine here somewhere? Where she at? Touch your neighbor. She know who I'm talking about. Amen. When we say God, the old patristic fathers and mothers proclaim that when we say God, we mean Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That when we talk about God, we're not talking about this abstract notion of a transcendent being. We're talking about the God that has been revealed to us through the life of Jesus and the tradition of faith of the followers who came thereafter. Why is that important? Because the God that we follow lives in community, God's self. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, it don't mean that there's three different thrones up there. And if you don't like what the Father say, I'm going to go talk to the Son. <laughs> and if you don't like what the Son got to say, I'm going to talk to the Holy Ghost. And if you don't like what the Son or the, the Holy Ghost got to say, I'm going to go talk to the Father. And if you don't like what none of them got to say, you're going to go talk to yourself. <laughs> How many know some of us just start at the talk to yourself? We don't even talk to God. But the theological con uh, uh, principle in this is that Father, Son, Holy Spirit are one. They live in community. The theological word is perichoresis. There is an interdependence in the life of the God of our salvation. And listen, the interdependence is not competitive. It is all sufficient. And it is what defines and makes God who God is. That interdependence is the God we serve. And when you and I worship idols, we start to depend on one thing and not the whole. And that's what's happening in our country. That's what's happening in our neighborhoods. We do not hold the whole. We hold the parts we like. And that's, that's, that's kind of human. But that's why you got to be in community with other people. Because it is the community of the faithful that keep us, that keep us from foregoing our responsibility of worshiping God versus the idols. Quick question. What then must you disentangle from your worship and devotion to God Versus your allegiance to the idols. How does idolatry show up in your life? And what is the idol asking you to compromise? Be clear, dear loved one, an idol does not exist without an ask. And if we keep it real, how many of us can at least acknowledge that there are some asks that are being whispered in my ear, in my heart, that are not compatible with the commands of the God of my soul. You and I can pull these high places down if we make a decision every day, somebody say every day, every day. to serve, worship, and follow the true and living God. Somebody say, follow God, follow God, follow God. Uh, the second thing that I'll lift up real quick is that in the text, they had to make a distinction between the righteous places or the high places. And I want you to appreciate, again, in the biblical text, righteousness, righteous, can also be translated as justice. Most of the time, when people think of righteousness, you think of a very pietistic, virtuous, no sin behavior kind of description. But how many of you know that even when you get locked into personal behavior, 
Uh, the early Methodist John Wesley, he, he said, there is no personal holiness without social holiness. So you can't even escape how your personal choices and behavior add up to help create a social holiness or well-being or righteousness. In the text, there were high places, places, listen, that they created so their idols could exist there. Elevated, constructed places where the idols can rest upon, can hang out, can sit. And it makes me think of what then do you and I build our lives and place them on? For some of us, I want to submit that we got some high places that we need to tear down. Places that war against the righteousness and justice of God. Some of us are building our lives on high places and not righteous places. Some of us are depending on these failed principles, economic principles that are failures, racial principles that are failures, gendered principles that are failures, class principles that are failures. And those are the foundations for our lives. But how many of you know that, like we said last week, if the foundation is cracked, there is a situation, a shaking or something that will happen that will cause whatever you have built on that foundation to crumble. And could it be that the church is being called in this moment to check what is our foundation? What have we built our lives on? We hear all these nationalistic narratives. But is the church of Jesus Christ built on an American foundation? Is that all that you and I have? To build our hopes on as the church in the United States of America that our high place is the Constitution. Our high place is the Declaration of Independence. Our high place is the amendments. Our high place is your degree, your color, your last name, your bank account. Is that the high place? And keep it real, is that high place doing good for you? Or are you working every day trying to keep your high place up? Or is that high place working you every day? Working you to the bone. Could it be that there is another way of life you and I are called to lean into? And it is this righteous place that I want to submit we are being called to entertain, to lean into. So question, what is holding you up? What is it that you are valuing the most? Are the internal principles of justice and righteousness sustaining you? Are white supremacy and human hierarchy the high places which inform your relationships to God, your neighbor, and the world? Are you tearing down the high places? Or are you building your life upon them? Josiah brought the children of Israel into a shared place and, listen, tore down all the high places. I want to submit to you, child of God, you and I are being called to tear down high places. In your family, in your own life, in your communities, in your neighborhoods. Here, the background of this, go to the next slide. The background of this picture is a artwork of Josiah. Next slide. Thank you. Artwork of Josiah and his comrades tearing down the high places, the places where the idols dwelt. That looks like a lot of work, don't it? It ain't like you just blow on it and it just falls over. I was struck by this image 
Because the high places required other people to help. The high places required comrades and friends who shared a common goal and purpose. Understanding of the world. And we may not be able to influence everybody. But we here at The Way, and by extension I pray the church, we can influence each other's notion of the high places. And we won't be so overdetermined by the failed empire we live in. You know, an empire that has totally existed on the premise of oppressing people who won't cooperate. I mean, you know, I was listening to the governor of Virginia yesterday talking about how people had to go home because they weren't welcome there. And I was saying to myself, now, you know you in Virginia, right? Where are they going to go? Like, you know, folks is coming here to Berkeley. People saying you're not welcome here. But I know members in our congregation who get called the N-word regularly. Folks who are getting ran up out the city, not because of Donald Trump. Touch your neighbor. So the question we all have to answer is, where is the high place in my life? I can look at the white supremacists and get my blood pressure all up because that's an easy out. But the question you got to answer is, is there a high place in my heart and in my life that makes it easy for me to disappear Someone God has placed in my circle of influence because I don't like them, agree with them. They are an inconvenience to me. Somebody just lift your hand up as high as you can. Get that high place in your mind and just pull it down, pull it down. I thank God for you to keep your hand up. Hope you're not stretching. Hope you're trying to figure out which high place it is. <laughs> So let's do it again. Let's do it again. Lift your hand up. Lift your hand up. Because how many know some of us got more than one? Get that high place in your mind. Pull it on down. Somebody say pull down the high places. Third thing that we got to be ready to do is resist and protest. Somebody say resist. Somebody say protest. I'm going to run through these quick because we talk about resistance and protesting all the time. You resist with your mind, protest with your body. We got a lot of folk who like to resist intellectually, but don't show up to do nothing physically. I got a resistance going on in my mind. That ain't helping nobody. I'm going to resist evil in my mind while I'm sitting on my couch. So when, when they come to take my loved ones away, I'm resisting in my mind. The devil is a lie. Can you believe what it'd been like if Jesus was like, I'm resisting this evil of death, hell, and the grave in my mind. Soon as he got hit with the whip, whap! No, resistance in my mind. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not here for that kind of resistance. <laughs> Hello, somebody. <laughs> Keep it real, kind of, that's how we wired. We intellectualize everything. Well, you know, I would do this, but then that would happen, and so I can't do that. And so I'm going to hedge my bet, and I'm going to take the road of least in your mind. That's not what this moment is calling for from the church. Maybe calling that from all the other folk. But the true church of God in this moment must not just resist in your mind. You must resist in your mind, no. Because as a man or a woman or a person thinks, so are you. So it ain't like you can... Really protest and struggle against the systemic evil without having your mind made up. Because if your mind is not made up and your heart is not convinced, when trouble comes your way, you will turn around. So someone's got to resist. Make up in your mind. Scripture says, resist the devil, he will flee from you. The resistance must happen in your mind. First, but it can't end in your mind. How do you show up physically? Protest is one way. There's a lot of ways to protest. 
I'm not going to tell you to go out there and get arrested, although I think every child of God should go to jail. <laughs> Give me my towel. <laughs> Touch your neighbor and tell him, you got to go to jail. You got to go to jail now. <laughs> go in the jail. Listen, listen to me. Listen to me. Going to jail for doing the right thing will bless your life. It will. I know some of y'all like, this preacher crazy. Well, some of the best texts that you read, hopefully every day, was written by somebody who was in jail. There's something about being persecuted for doing the right thing. That gives you anointing and power and clarity. It steals and robs you of your privilege. Because some of us think that you can make enough money and get a position and, and get a title. And then you are exempt. But how many know there is none of us that are exempt from the fragility of life? When I went to jail, I had to sleep with bugs and and, and, and vermin, and, 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 and after a while, I had to tuck my, my, my pants into my socks and, and my, my shirt into my pants, and I just laid there, and I said, Lord, if you take me tonight, <laughs> just please don't let there be no bugs in my mouth. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. But it also introduced me to all kinds of divine surprises I would not have ever engaged. So I want you and I to realize that it's okay to put yourself in the way of trouble for righteousness sake. It will work the wickedness out in your heart as a child of God if you resist and protest. Last thing I want us to do is protect and heal. Somebody say protect, protect. And, heal. and heal. All kind of trauma going on in the world. We'll, we'll pick this up a little bit later because our time is gone and this deserves a whole sermon of self-care in and of itself. But we must protect one another. We must look out for one another. We must give each other the space to heal and be a healer. And part of the ways we do that is to be in relationship, meaningful relationship with one another. If you are walking through life alone, you are literally walking without a protector and without a healer. You are not meant to walk through life alone. That is why the church exists. Because at the church, we don't get to pick and choose who we got to be church with. I know some of us want to. But as they get the communion table ready, I want you to understand that this table is the decision maker for who belongs in the house of God. All of us have to come and receive the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have to acknowledge that it was the generosity and sacrificial love of our Savior that unlocked the door for us to be a part of God's body. What because of where you lived and who you are and what nation you are part of. Don't you know God loves the church in North Korea? Just as much as God loves the church in the United States, just as much as God loves the church in Venezuela, just as much as God loves the church in Russia. And can I take further? God loves the people in North Korea who are in the church just as much as he loves the people who are not in the church in the United States, just as much as he loves the people who are not in church in Russia. Why? Going back to my first scripture, because the earth is the Lord's and everything that dwells in it. 
What's at stake if we don't pull down these strongholds? If we don't pull down these high places? If we do not defeat racism and patriarchy and white supremacy and all these other isms? What's at stake is that we will not steward God's creation and one another well. And if we don't steward one another well, then we will stand by while our loved ones, humanity is taken away. I and we as a church, come on up, as long as I am the pastor here, we will not fall down on our stewardship. It may be difficult and it may be uncomfortable, but we will be God's people. And as a church, we will live out that calling in the world. Stand with me, everyone. Another thing that we got to practice is conversion. After every practice, you have to open yourself up to being changed. Don't stay the same, loved ones, but be open to a transformed difference. The Eucharist celebration simply reminds us of this great sacrifice.